Hello. Um, this is an interview between beloved teacher, Mr. Spence, and I. This is a fantastic interview um, where we get a deeper look into Mr. Spence's life in teaching, um, what inspired him to be a teacher, and um, a little side anecdote about childhood best friends. Thank you for watching. Okay. Um, what's your name? Gerard Spence. Gerard Spence. And yes. how long have you been working here? 28 years. 28 years. At Hope High School. Um, and I wanted to mostly get into teaching and just the development of it over the years. Mm -hmm. um, the you mean how it's changed? Or? Yes. Okay. And one of my questions was, um, do you think teaching itself at its like very core has gotten easier or harder? Or do you think it's remained the same? Okay, I think it's gotten harder. Okay. My uh, attitude has always been um, that I want to treat my students the same way that I want my own kids to be treated. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's fine. Yeah. I can do that. But what I find in the last, especially in the last 10 years, maybe 12 years, there's been more and more emphasis on state regulations. Okay. Um, I'm going to say codes, but they're kind of educational codes. Okay. Additional requirements that we have to do that makes me feel sometimes like a quasi-administrator. And okay. I don't come in the classroom to be a quasi-administrator. I come into the classroom to try and show kids something about the past and yeah. the value of learning. Yeah. It, it doesn't feel like teaching students yes. on a lot of days, yeah. which I don't like as much. So you feel that it's taken away from the very core of teaching? Mm. The state regulations? Which is sharing knowledge, right? Yes. Teaching should be, so take some of your experience as an adult and share it with younger people, goods and negative, positive yeah. things and negative things, yeah. but that does learning experiences and it's harder to find time to really share those types of things yeah. um, because of mandates and regulations. Yeah. So along with mandates, do you think that students have have like anything to do with it? Do you think that there's a reason to our yeah. madness? I think the reason is these okay. and the Chromebooks that we've put in front of students yeah. because there's so many distractions, whether that's a form of there's different forms of social media, or whether it's kids are just more just more and more distractible. Yeah. It's, you have to be an educator, but you have to be an entertainer. Yeah. You have to be um, a quasi-parent. Yeah. You have to, uh, there's so many levels to it, and maybe this is true always, but with technology and different sort of immediate forms of interaction that students have with screens and yeah. with technology itself. Makes okay. It is. It's immediate gratif yeah. gratification. Like, um, I want to know this now. Okay. Yeah. Well, with Google, you can do that. Yeah. So where's the learning yeah. process in okay. that? Where's the the value in actually gathering information mm -hmm. and students being able to make their own decisions and their own judgments, mm -hmm. rather than being told by some outside yeah. source okay. that they'll never meet. Yeah. So it's less personal. Okay. It's become less personal. Okay. I think. You do believe that from generation, do you, is there a consistent kind of energy to the students? Like, do you think it has changed a lot since when you first started teaching? Just behavior? Mm. And no, no. Okay. I, I think behaviors, behaviorized things, I don't think they change. Okay. Kids are kids. Yes. Um, okay. I remember some of the Nimrods that I went to school with yeah. years ago. It's the same thing. There were some some kids that were very clued in. There were some kids that were totally distracted. I see the same thing, the same parallels today. I just think that in the last, I'm going to say 12, I said 12 years, maybe it's 15 years. Yeah. I think the influx of technology draws students' attention away in a okay. different direction, an additional direction, mm -hmm. which makes it hard to focus on yeah. Something learning something that really could be valuable for kids down the road. Okay. They have trouble seeing it right now mm -hmm. because they're so engaged with Facebook or TikTok or Snapchat, mm -hmm. right? I don't even know them all. Instagram. You got it though. Yeah. So that's hard. Yeah. That's hard to yeah. fight against. Um, another thing I wanted to get into is is there anything, any way, because obviously the taking of like the phones away, obviously, that's a it, that's a big thing as of recent, but do you think that there's any way to encourage kids to 
engage more? Like, is there a certain um, topic that you've grown to love and you've learned that kids kind of engage more? Any teaching style? Oh, that's tough. Um, yeah, I think that kids are in, they're engageable, but I think a lot of teaching now, if you're going to grab the kids' atten- the kids plural attention, is you've got to find things that are not only informative but they're also entertaining, and that takes a ton of energy yeah. to always be the or feel like you have to be. Um, the leader of a discussion okay. and, and create thinking or create topics, yeah. come up with topics that are going to grab the student's attention okay. because their attention is drawn so many other places all at once. So I think that has changed. I think there's, I think the attention span in the classroom is less than it was 10 years yeah. ago. But I do, I do think that, um, just this is a side comment, when you were teaching the You and the Law kids with documentaries. Mm-hmm. I think that's perfect. And I think it's just like, I feel like when it comes to students, you have to like relate to them. You do. And I find it's easier for me to relate mm-hmm. to, say, my juniors and seniors yes. than it is to my ninth graders. Okay. And maybe I'm in the ninth grade mode now because we're at lunch from, I'm, I'm in the midst of my ninth grade class, and this one particular mm-hmm. is a lot of immaturity, it's a lot of yeah. um, sort of attention seeking behaviors on their part, yeah. and it's hard to draw them in. They're the mm-hmm. most challenging group that I have this yeah. year so far. But yeah, as you say, the, my You in the Law class, mm-hmm. it's, mm-hmm. it's much easier to engage those students okay. because you can pick topics that matter to them, yeah. and there's some maturing that has gone on between, mm-hmm. say, age 15 and age 17 yeah. it's, a, it's market a market mm-hmm. difference so which on to that mm. um more on to you in mm-hmm. your childhood mm-hmm. and when did you feel like that switch happened for you when did you feel the maturity happened and for me mm-hmm. um well i mean i'm thinking i'll just give free thought okay. first age that comes to mind is eighth grade okay but I have a little bit of a different history in the sense that I came from a different country. I came from a di- totally different school system, totally different school philosophy. Mm-hmm. And it took me, yeah, it took, probably took me fifth, sixth, and seventh grade to yeah. figure out what was going on in schools here in America versus where I came from. Um, so what age did you move? I, I, was, I turned 10 a month okay. after we arrived in the US. Okay. So I was young. And I had so much to learn not as far as material that was being introduced into school, but also the social side of things, because I came to a different country. And yeah. There was so much I didn't understand. So I think my maturing was a little bit different. But eighth grade seemed to me seems to be the point where I actually began to sort of figure things out and yeah. fathom how I fit into the social scene of school, and then I could focus on what. I wanted to do. And then in ninth grade, I had two teachers, a science teacher and an English teacher. And I got chosen as a, one of the students who we went and did um, like a, long, a long research project that had multiple steps in it. And my, almost like my advisors was my English teacher and my science teacher. And we got to go to the concert conferences and presentations, and then we gave a big presentation at the end of the year yeah. on it. And that was a, that was like a highlight for me because I think I felt like I'd been selected away from mm-hmm. other students into this special project mm-hmm. that was a pilot project. So yeah. the school didn't really know if it was going to work or not. Yeah. Um, and I thought I think it clicked in for me then. Oh, this idea of learning can mm-hmm. be fun. Yeah. And interesting. So. Okay. Awesome. You had your time to shine. Yeah. You had your influences. Yeah. Awesome. Perfect. And it, and it was something that mattered enough that the school did it. Yeah. So it was it was very uh, very interesting. That's that's awesome. That's very mm-hmm. cool. And this is literally just me being curious because mm-hmm. I need to ask you this question. Mm-hmm. Did you have a childhood best friend? And. Childhood best friend. Mm-hmm. Yes. And can you elaborate? Okay. So. 
I feel like I had two different childhoods, right? Okay. So I had a childhood in the UK yep. through fourth grade. I hated, hated, hated going to school. Okay. I can't say it enough. Everything about it turned my stomach, okay. literally. Not just figuratively, yeah. literally. Um, but I had a friend, my, his name was Guy Sheffield, and um, we were very close. And then I had other sort of friends, it's like a friend group. Yeah. The guy Sheffield was my best friend, mm -hmm. and I just I enjoyed him. Um, we just meshed. The yeah. two of us just meshed. Mm -hmm. Then I moved right from yeah. the UK to here. I, no more Guy Sheffield. No more Nicky Anderson. None of my friends mm -hmm. that I had in England could, were here, mm -hmm. so I had to make new friends. And then my friend, who I formed a friendship with, probably in seventh grade, was Nick Bavanikis. And he came from his Greek family. His parents were right from Greece. They ran, um, they owned Mike's Pizza mm -hmm. in, in the small town where I lived. And okay. uh, Nick and I were inseparable. Inseparable. Mm -hmm. So. Very similar backgrounds, though, from different places. Didn't you say that your dad had the, the store on campus? So my dad, my mom and dad bought a house mm -hmm. on the edge of Wheaton College. Mm -hmm. And half of our house was a shop. It was yeah. called the campus shop, and it catered to all of the Wheaton students. Mm -hmm. So there were Wheaton students who worked for my mom as she ran the shop, and then they came in and out as they bought all of their supplies. Everything was in that shop yeah. except for textbooks, mm -hmm. like a real college campus shop. Mm -hmm. um, so that was an interesting experience yeah. too. And uh, when you say that's a similar parallel, what, what, do, you, what do you mean? What did you mean? You said that his parents were straight from Greece. Oh, right? they were, yes. So you both came from And my family was yeah. from another place. Yeah, you, right? be, you came from different cultural backgrounds. Yes, yes, yes. Coping with America together. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I don't know the reasons exactly why yeah. the Babanikases came to the U.S. Yeah. Um, I knew Mr. and Mrs. Babanikas well, but not enough to ask them yeah. those types of questions. My dad came because he was recruited by Texas Instruments, mm -hmm. so there was a real reason for us to yeah. come across the big ocean. I didn't want to, mm -hmm. um, not at all. So I guess, yeah, that's, that's, there is a parallel there, right? It's all about my friend Nick, his family had yeah. to acclimate to a new culture, I had to acclimate to a new culture, and, and uh, yeah, we did a lot of things together. That's funny. Mm. Okay. Very, very constructive things together. Yeah. We did some, <laughs> Risky things to teenager together too. Things. We did teenager Playing things. Hugging. Those types of things. Yeah. But okay, perfect. This is Mr. Spence. I'm Summer Reinhardt. Let's go. Thank you. Okay.